Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Creating a Pollinator Paradise with Melinda Myers, uh, hosted by Milwaukee Public Library. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes to uh, join the event here, uh, and then we will get started. So just sit tight just a couple minutes. Hey there, Heidi from Ohio. See, we've got lots of people joining in, so we'll get started in just a moment. Good evening, everyone. Just going to give everyone a moment to join the event and then uh, we'll get started with uh, tonight's presentation of Melinda Myers. So uh, just sit tight, we'll get started in just a moment. see a question in the chat uh, from Laura. Yes, there is a hand up for the talk. So yeah, we'll share that um, as soon as we get started here in one moment, just let, letting everyone um, join the event here. So. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's get to it. So uh, hello again, everyone. Welcome to Creating a Pollinator Paradise. Uh, uh, this presentation is uh, hosted this evening by Melinda Myers, gardening expert and horticultural guru. Um, <laughs> we are very excited to welcome Melinda uh, back for this presentation. This is the first webinar uh, during the month of June, which is Pollinator Month. Um, so this will be the first in a series of three webinars, and we're going to learn all about uh, creating a positive and supportive environment for our pollinator friends. Um, and we're excited to um, we're excited to learn um, how we can do that. And with that, uh, also, I will say to some housekeeping bits, um, joining me tonight is librarian Beth, who will also be keeping an eye on the Q&A in the chat here. So if you have any questions, um, we should have time at the end for those. So drop any questions in the Q&A and feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat box if you'd like. Um, your microphones are muted and cameras should be off, but again, we will have time at the end for questions. So, um, so we're excited to learn uh, once again with Melinda Myers. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Melinda. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight, but also for your interest in supporting pollinators. You obviously know how important they are and you can help us spread the word. I wanna thank American Transmission Company and the Grow Smart program for sponsoring this webinar and many of the activities I'm involved with throughout the month of June. I wanna thank Milwaukee Public Library for hosting the event. Um, it always takes a lot of the pressure off of me when they do the technology and it's such a great partnership. We've worked together on several webinars, so I always appreciate the opportunity to work with the library. And the exciting part is June is Pollinator Month, as Kelly mentioned, but public libraries across Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, many of them are joining in, providing story hours, take and make. So talk to your local librarian, stop by, see what's happening there. Um, we're so excited. The libraries are such a great group of enthusiastic educators that just want to help everybody learn. So check out what's happening locally. We have produced, I produced three videos, how-to videos that are available to view for free, and there are accompanying activity sheets as well. And then as I mentioned, uh, many libraries are doing pollinator-related story time and so much more. We really want to emphasize the importance of pollinators. Some of you may have done No Mo May. This is that next step in supporting our pollinators. 
So why do they need our help? Again, I may be speaking to the choir here, but a lot of things have happened that are really threatening our pollinators. One is habitat loss. Think about building, construction, and all of that. And yes, we need houses to live in and energy and all those things, but we have destroyed a lot of habitat. And so looking for ways that we can help create some of that habitat in our own backyard. Diseases, predators, and parasites. Also, you've probably read the newspaper and hear of a lot about that. And then something else we have some control over is our use of chemicals. Insecticides, that's pretty clear, right? Insecticides are meant to kill insects, pollinators other than the hummingbirds are insects. And so it makes a lot of sense. And even organic and natural products need to be used cautiously because they're made to kill things. So always read the label before using anything. Fungicides may be something you're not as familiar with. Why? Well, how does that impact our pollinators? Well, if bees, for example, use a certain naturally occurring fungus to make this bee bread that they feed them their offspring and feed it themselves. And so if we kill all the bad fungi, we kill the good stuff, then they don't have that food source. And herbicides are plant killers, and they kill a lot of the plants that bees depend upon. Those weeds, those plants out of place, we often are trying to eliminate. Um, you probably heard a lot about no mow may and letting those dandelions bloom. Now, when I lived in the city, I could easily deadhead the few dandelions so I could let the pollinators enjoy the the dandelions, the clovers were nitrogen fixers, so I was welcoming them. Now I live out in the country and uh, my neighbors don't care if the dandelions uh, share some seeds to their property. So it's a little bit easier where I live now. So creating pollinator habitats is something American Transmission Company is doing. You can see those utility lines in the background. So here they have this perfect opportunity, no trees, no tall shrubs under utility lines for safety and for securing the power flow, right? And so what they're doing is they're planting a lot of native plants that are pollinator friendly. In fact, they're monitoring the monarch's migration through Wisconsin and the UP so that they beef up the milkweed collection in those plantings so that they're supporting the monarchs on their migration north and south, as well as other pollinators. So creating beautiful gardens, but pollinator friendly habitats. Now, what do they need? They need the same things we do, food, water, shelter, and places to raise their young. And so we're looking at creating gardens, habitats that do just that in our yards. Food for various pollinators. Now, when we think of pollinators, you probably read a lot about hun honeybees and the monarch, but there's so many others that are often overlooked. So for butterflies, they like bright colors. Things with red and purple are some of their favorites. So looking at, and that's probably something you know, and we like those bright colors. They like narrow tubes. They have those long proboscis for getting into that nectar, and that's how they help spread that pollen. And they like something they can land upon. So you can see here, how the salvia provides that little lip so that butterfly can sit on that while it laps up the nectar. Uh, moths typically like pale or dull red, purple, pink, or white flowers. They don't go for those bright colors like the butterflies do. There are some day flying moths. You can hear, see this is one on a milkweed, but a lot of them feed in the evening. And these, if you've ever seen a sphinx moth, they're pretty big. Um, so they like things like four o'clock. So on your list, I include a few night blooming plants and four o'clock get their name because they start blooming blooming in the at late afternoon or evening, flowers are open all day and fade at night. This is a hawk moth and sometimes mistaken for a hummingbird if you've ever seen one because their wings move fast and they're pretty big and it's often easy to see them. There are some day flying hawk moths as well as night flying hawk moths. And then bees are attracted to bright white, yellow, blue, or UV. We're going to spend more time on bees next uh, webinar on the 15th, where I'm going to focus on bees and supporting the bees, native as well as our honeybees. And then beetles. We don't think sometimes about the good things that beetles do. And boy, it was a great month for June or May beetles, depend on how you learned them when you grew up all over the lights on my property um, at night. But beetles are kind of generalists. They just kind of wander and they move pollen kind of accidentally. They are attracted to strong smelling scented flowers. So you often see them then. Um, 
doll or green blooms. And I wanted to include this soldier beetle because you often see soldier beetles on plants and they look like something you want to get rid of, but they're actually good guys. They don't harm the plants. They do eat the pollen, but not at a level that hurts for reseeding because pollination needs to occur, then fertilization, then for seeds to appear. But they just kind of wander over and as they're wandering, they're taking the pollen with them. So this is a rattlesnake master we'll talk about in a few minutes. Flies, yes, I know they can be very annoying, but they're also generalists, much like the beetles. And so they are spreading pollen as they go from smaller flowers, often in shady or moist habitats. They do like pale, dull, or brown flowers are purple, and we'll see some in a little bit. And this is a robber fly you can see up there on the corner. And shallow funnel-like or complex trap-like um, flowers. So often they go in and they're, they're kind of have a struggle getting out of the flower, and that's how the pollen goes on their body, and then they spread it to the next flower. And then hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, uh, the activity, they're the bird for us that pollinates flowers. There's one um, out in the desert area that does soaro cacti, but hummingbirds are the big pollinator. And they like bright colored tubular flowers. As you can see, this one's nectaring on a bee bomb. And then if you do have that overripe banana or orange, you might wanna stick that out in a shallow tray off the ground where bees, beetles, and butterflies can lap up some of those minerals from that rotting fruit. So when we're planting our gardens, we want to include multiple layers because you'll have some pollinators that live or reside in the leaf litter. You'll have some that will pollinate lower flowers, some middle size, and then some that will be laying their eggs on trees and shrubs. Those are host plants or on the grass plants. And so having multiple layers, one, it's more interesting for us to look at when you look at this garden, but it's also then provides home for a variety of pollinators pollinators. If you have space to allow some snags, fallen trees or branches, um, even under stones, you may find some and leaf litter. This is a leaf cutter bee and we'll talk more about them next week. But one of the cool things about them is they cut out these little pieces of leaves and then they line their um, their, their home, their solitary, so one bee per hole, and that's where they lay their eggs. So they'll go in, in holes in trees where maybe an insect burrowed in or there was damage or a woodpecker created a hole going after an insect. Water. And we often don't think about water. And last summer's drought really probably brought good attention because I saw a lot more pollinators at my bird bath than normal. And so providing water is important for them as well. If you have a bird bath, one with gentle slides, sloping sides, or put a few stones in there so that the pollinators can rest on the stones and lap up the water. They don't always need to take a bath. It's good for the birds as well. And I know when you see the, wasp, you think, oh no, but the paper wasp, wasp are pollinators as well. It's just trying to keep their homes maybe out of our way or we're out of their way so we don't end up with stings. Um, puddles, damp spots, um, having maybe a shallow container filled with sand, keep it damp, sprinkle a little wood ash or sea salt. And then what happens is the butterflies and bees will gather there and they'll lap up that mineral rich water. And if you've got gravel on your property or you go by a parking lot or a gravel driveway after a rain, you'll often see them gathered there because they're lapping up some of those minerals. So by creating this, you're giving them a place to gather some of that mineral rich water that you're creating photo ops and observational opportunities so that you can see a group like we have, see here of swallowtail caterpillars that you can observe and enjoy their visit to your yard. And a warming stone, insects warm their body by the temperature around them in the sunlight. So having a flat stone or an area with a flat portion on a boulder allows them to spread their wings and warm up. Again, another opportunity for you to enjoy their visit and their beauty. So here are some design strategies to consider when planning your garden. 
We design them for beauty for us, so we just need to keep pollinators in mind. Plant in masses. This is Lurie Gardens in Chicago in Millennial Park. If you haven't been there, it's definitely worth the visit. Um, I was there the end of June. This picture was taken the end of June. Um, you'll see salvia is an allium, but notice how large masses. So what's great is a good display for us to enjoy, but planting in masses provides easy and efficient access to the pollen and the nectar. So the butterfly, the bee, only has to go from one clump of salvia to the next, like you see here at Northwind Perennial, versus your salvia and down the block to the neighbor. So it makes, they use less energy going from one source of food to the next. It also creates some continuous cover. And that's really important to keep them safe from their predators. Maybe you don't have room to have a huge garden like Lurie Gardens or uh, Northwind Perennial. And so maybe it's joining forces with your neighbor. Maybe you put a garden on your border. So instead of a fence down the two yards, you put a garden that you join forces to create a larger space and more space efficient. But even if you only have room for a window box, you can make a difference. I'm lucky enough to appear on our public radio show occasionally. And years ago, I was talking about planting for butterflies and pollinators. And somebody called in and said, well, what if I have a window box? I live in an apartment, you know, on like the sixth floor. And I said, oh, yeah, you'll be able to attract them. And in true public radio form, somebody called in and said, I live in an apartment in downtown Chicago and I get pollinators to my window box and I'm up even higher. So you can make a difference even with those small spaces if that's what you have. Now I talked about the different type of flowers that various pollinators need. So using a wide variety of plants will add some interest and beauty for you to enjoy, but will also help support and attract a wide range of pollinators. And even though we don't think of beetles and flies as important members, they are doing some pollination. So it's important to invite all of these pollinators to our landscape. Native plants are always a good choice whenever possible and appropriate. And I say appropriate because our soils aren't the same, our climate's a little different, and some natives really spread rapidly. And so you wanna pick a native plant that will survive the growing conditions in your yard and fit that available space. And so there's lots of good choices. On my website, I think I repo, I know I reposted, um, strategies for adding native plants to your landscape and talk about those that are clumpers or a little less aggressive. So it gives opportunities to more people. And here's one of those soldier beetles again on a, one of our native rubecchia. Now native versus native vars. So native plants like this switchgrass, which is Panicum brigatum. So this is the native. It reseeds readily. It is a wonderful plant, but it takes up lots of space that you may not have room for. Now, people that are purely native plants only feel that these are the only plants because they really are the most efficient. Insects and birds have evolved with these plants so that they really are meant to live together in the same habitat. Unfortunately for people in the city, you may not have room for a huge planting of switchgrass. So the people that are in favor of native ours feel that this is a good second option. So if you don't have room for those bigger native plants that may be too aggressive for your small lot, uh, small lot or outgrow the available space that this gives people a chance to grow something closely related to the native plants. On your handout, there are some links that talk about things to consider. I'm not telling you what to do, it's your garden, just kind of explaining that discussion so you have a little better insight to make your decision. Different bloom times. I grow lots of bulbs because I can't wait for color in the spring, and I find lots of pollinators, like you can see here, the bee on the checker lily. Um, so we want to make sure that we have something early spring. That was the whole idea of Nomo May, allowing some of those plants we call weeds grow and flower. Um, but there are other choices too, bulbs that you may have in your garden. And then maybe something that you uh, grow that'll provide summer and fall. This is a Cheyenne spirit coneflower in my backyard. Crocosmia is the red up in the corner that the hummingbirds live. And Agastache or Anis hyssop is oh, a pollinator favorite I'll show you later. So this is my summer into fall bloomer. 
and then leave your perennial stand for winter. Many insects, uh, many of the beneficial insects overwinter in the stems of these plants. So leaving them stand for winter really provides home, winter homes for many. They also provide food for a variety of birds. And I don't know about you, but winters can be long and that color and motion that songbirds add. And those songbirds will come back and eat a lot of insects in spring and summer. And so feeding them in the winter, I don't have to fill the feeders. It's great. I get to enjoy the beauty for the winter garden. And if we have any Southerners joining us, this is what a Northern gardener looks at in the winter and we're grateful for it. So good food source for the birds as well. Leave those perennials stand, a lot of debate, but at least till we have three to five or seven days of 55 degree temperatures so that most of the pollinators have left. One of the things if you can't stand to wait that long is you can cut them back and then stack them out of sight. And then that way, if there are any, any beneficial insects still hibernating, they'll be able to leave and then set up their summer home. Um, I mentioned that moths liked uh, to nectar during the evening. So plants like the four o'clock I mentioned or Nicotiana, if you've grown Nicotiana flowering tobacco, oh, fragrant in the evening. So those flowers are effective all evening long. And during the day, you'll get hummingbirds and butterflies visiting them as well. Various colors and shapes, as I mentioned, attract different kind of insects. I always like to show this picture of the great black wasp. I have quite a few of them visiting my garden. It's a great pollinator. It looks pretty scary. In fact, my grandkids came running out of the garden and were afraid it was going to sting them, and it wouldn't. It was busy nectaring, and it looks scary or it really won't bother you. Single flowers are better than doubles. A couple reasons. Single flowers have more reproductive parts and the reproductive parts are, contain the pollen and the nectar that those uh, pollinators are after and the reason we need them to spread the pollen. So, and it's also easier for them to land. So think about being a butterfly. If you've got a flat surface, it's a lot easier for them. And then they can access all of that. So if you have a choice, if you're looking at say zinnias, and you have a choice between single or double, if you're thinking pollinators, do the single variety. I always like to do a shout out to Digger's Hotline um, or call 811 anywhere in the country. Um, Digger's Hotline, diggershotline.com, you can file online. Always call or file online three business days before digging in. They will come out and mark the utilities. They'll either put flags or paint or do both. And if you have to work near the utility within 18 inches, hand dig. Um, even though utilities are supposed to be down deep, sometimes soil settles, whatever, that's for your safety. It's about being safe. It's reducing in the risk of harm to you and even death. Inconvenience, you knock out the cable, your family and neighbors are not going to be happy and it can save you money because if you don't call them and you accidentally knock out an underground utility in your work area and you have not called them, you're responsible for the repair. Save that money for plants instead. So let's talk about a few plants, what we gardeners like to do. And what a great excuse to garden, right? We're helping the pollinators, creating a beautiful landscape with the plants we enjoy. I've teamed up with American Transmission Company with their Grow Smart program. It's about growing pollinator friendly plants. And as I mentioned, they're doing it and they're inviting us to do the same, even if you don't have transmission lines going through your yard. So we've got this wonderful pollinator friendly pollinator planting guide that talks about different native plants and the pollinators it attracts um, on their website. Also, and there's a link on your handout are some videos I've worked with them and some other information. So check that out, a great source of material. So let's talk about a few plants. We're gonna start with some low growing trees. This is the larval host. So this is the caterpillar of the red spotted purple butterfly. Um, you can guess what its disguise is from its predators. It looks like bird poop. So not too tasty. And I wanna thank Jim McCormick for use of his slide. So this host plant, the, cat, the butterfly lays its eggs on the leaves of the service berry and it hatches into this, and then it'll eventually pupate and turn into this beautiful butterfly. Hard to believe, isn't it? And so then it will nectar on a variety of flowers. 
in case you haven't seen a service berry, one of my favorite plants, wonderful white flowers in the spring, great for butterflies and bees, followed by fruit in June. It's also called June berry sometimes. And you can eat them if you can beat the birds to them. Cedar wax wings and robins love them. And I don't know where they poop the seeds, but I've grown this plant in my city lot, never found seedlings in the neighborhood. And I have one that came with the house I bought now. And again, I don't find seedlings. So that's a good thing. I don't, I'm not weeding them out of my flower bed or other plantings and beautiful fall color. So you've got multiple seasons of interest. Host plant, it's for the birds and also other pollinators. So a great plant for you and the pollinators. A close relative is aronia. And I should have mentioned service berry takes full sun to shade, moist, well-drained soils. Very similar to aronia or chokeberry. And chokeberry, uh, the name really describes the fruit. If you've ever eaten one of these, oh, it's very astringent. It just sucks the spit out of your mouth. Now, there are people making chokeberry wine and jam. My feeling is you ferment it or you add enough sugar, anything tastes good. Um, and it's so astringent that the birds don't bother it until midwinter after it's fermented. So you get to enjoy the beauty of the berries. So wonderful flowers for the pollinators in the spring, fruit that the birds eventually eat, you get to enjoy, and great fall color. You'll see chokeberries used in rain gardens because it tolerates wet as well as dry soil once established, full sun to shade. Both service berry and chokeberry or roni are a little slow to establish. So the first year, a few years, it seems like they're doing nothing. They're putting down roots and then they take off. If you're looking for a native var, this is the Lowscape series. Lowscape hedger is more upright, doesn't colonize as rapidly, so great for hedging. Lowscape mound is shorter, two to three feet tall and rounded. And there's one called ground hug that's only six inches tall and designed to be a ground cover. Lilacs, not native, wonderfully fragrant. And uh, this is in my back, um, right out between my two patios. And it's a weeping lilac. And you can see I have my hummingbird feeder there. And in the backdrop, you can see my major wheeler honeysuckle vine. What's wonderful is the hummingbirds will nectar along with the bees and the butterflies on the lilac. They'll take a sip from the feeder, they'll nectar on the honeysuckle vine, and they'll eat the aphids off my honeysuckle. So they're getting some protein, helping control the insects. It's right outside my kitchen window, so I get to watch them visit, and they love to rest on the lilac when they're not feeding on those plants or the feeder. Now, this critter looks pretty scary. If you were a bird, you might think twice before eating it. It's the larva of the spice vine swallow, spice bush, sorry, swallowtail. Spice bush is a small tree or large uh, shrub. And this is the adult. Isn't it beautiful? Uh, just a gorgeous one, nectaring on verbena. So the lar they lay their eggs on the spice bush pupates, turns into this beautiful swallowtail, and the process goes again. Spice bush, as I mentioned, is a small tree or large shrub. It tolerates some shade, full sun to shade, um, especially those of you in hotter areas, definitely some afternoon shade. Fragrant yellow flowers in the spring, followed by edible fruit you and the birds can eat, and beautiful yellow fall color. So a nice small scale tree. My, my problem is I've been looking for a decent sized plant and I've been having trouble finding one to purchase to add to my yard. So it might be one of those, somebody told me uh, one of their nature centers selling native plants, they were able to find one there. So you might wanna just keep an eye out if you're looking to add that. Another native is nine bark. And the picture on the right is normal. That's what the bark looks like. It's exfoliating, so it's great against a winter sky. Again, I'm in the north, so that's beautiful winter interest. On the left is the straight species. It has flowers, kind of a pinkish white flower in the spring, followed by these capsules, these brown capsules. And the seeds do feed some songbirds and mammals as well. So the flowers attract the pollinator. It is a larval host for a couple of caterpillars, which then brought me to many of the new introductions of nine bark. And I have several. I have fireside that I love that has a reddish purple leaf. And look at those beautiful flowers. I have amber jubilee with yellow, purple, and 
uh, green leaves and gorgeous. But I was doing some reading and they were saying that purple leafed plants are not favored by many of the caterpillars. And I, I started thinking about my red cabbage in my garden. I get a lot fewer cabbage worms on my red than my green cabbage. So it's the anthocyanins, the pigments that um, sometimes repel some insect feeding. So I do have some of the more decorative nine bark, but I make sure I plant plenty of other host plants for the pollinators. So I could have a little bit of both. I'm lucky enough to have the room to do so. Another native is buttonbush, um, Cephalanthus, and it's a summer bloomer. So that's a plus. It's native to marshy areas and it attracts bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. We were shooting a Melinda's Garden Moment video on summer flowering shrubs, the place the nursery we were shooting at. These button bush plants were covered with pollinators. It was great. Then the seed capsules are spherical. Um, they start out red and turn brown and persist. And then songbirds and some small mammals will eat the seeds. The straight species, um, it takes full sun. It'll take a little shade, likes moist soil. The straight species is about six or seven feet tall. There are some more compact varieties, a little more neater and tidier appearance ping pong and sugar shack. So you can tell how old those breeders were. And this is what the plant looks like. I have pure sand and I'm looking for that moist spot because I love this shrub. Um, I am gonna find an area either where I can make sure it gets sufficient water or maybe a lower spot on my property. Another native summer bloomer is bush honeysuckle, not related to that invasive Linicera, it's a dervilla. And it's a wonderful plant, Yellow flowers, hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees will pollinate. It has arching branches that are green in the summer. You can see the new growth has a little bit of a bronze tinge to it. And then the fall color is a bronzy purple as well. It does colonize, so it's perfect for erosion control, perfect for a slope, nice in the front foreground because it grows about three feet tall and is wider. Shade tolerant, which is a real plus for this and end the season with common witch hazel. And the, the winter blooming, February, March blooming one is a great way to start the season. Um, I always like to talk about witch hazel as a Northern gardener. So when the leaves turn yellow and then they drop, they reveal these fun flowers in October, November, and December, they're fragrant. And if you've wondered who pollinates these things, right? Who's out that time of year? There's a moth called a shivering moth that lives in the leaf litter um, under the plants. And then it starts shivering to warm up its wings muscles, comes up, pollinates these flowers in the fall and early winter, goes back, warms up under the leaf litter, and then repeats. So the plants are pollinated when in bloom, but then that pollen doesn't move through to fertilize the flower until spring, and then the seeds mature in the fall. Just kind of interesting. Again, notice how the insect and the plant evolve together. And then I mentioned uh, coral honeysuckle vine. Full sun, it will tolerate shade. You might get a little bit of mildew if you put it in too much shade. It's a fast grower, but it's not rampant like trumpet vine. I like trumpet vine too, and the hummingbirds too do also, but it does send up suckers. So full sun, part shade, wonderful flowers, blooms pretty much throughout the summer, which is positive. This is Major Wheeler. This is a cultivar of our native honeysuckle vine. And what I like about this is it tends to be resistant to powdery mildew. So if you've grown our coral honeysuckle vine, it does get mildew and aphids. As I mentioned, the hummingbirds come and nectar on this and then they eat the aphids. So I haven't had a problem with aphids at all. So it was, it's a great, wonderful relationship we have. So honeysuckle vine, a good choice. You'll get flowers good to train on a truck full sun to part shade, morning sun's perfect for it. Okay, a few perennials. You can guess who pollinates this, right? Fly, skunk cabbage blooms early. It's native to boggy, wet areas. And then when the leaves um, expand, so the first thing, that's the flower you're looking at, and it does smell like a skunk. I used to teach uh, 
uh, flower class for uh, people going in the profession. I made them all take a whiff and it does smell. So it attracts flies and it attracts beetles that pollinate it. So the flowers come up first and you can see the leaves are starting to emerge and they're huge. And they remind me of a hosta actually on steroids, not as refined, but if you're tired of feeding the rabbits and deer, your hostas, you might try skunk cabbage for those shady wet areas. Fun flowers, great leaves that persist all season long. And don't forget about woodland wildflowers. That's a great way to take care of those early visiting bees and pollinators. Um, spring beauty is a wonderful plant for shaded areas, but think about the get a fair amount of sun because the tree leaves aren't out yet. Beautiful, brighten up that uh, woodland area or woodland edge on your property or shady spots in the garden. And it's a great way to take care of those early pollinators. Woodland phlox, lightly fragrant, um, early blooming. Uh, this is our native uh, phlox. Hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees will nectar on these flowers. Um, I find it it's not always the longest lived um, wildflower, but it is a wonderful addition and a beautiful periwinkle blue. Golden Alexander, great for many of our native bees, also good for butterflies. It will take sun to shade. It takes moist to wet soils, often used in rain gardens and shoreline plantings. And look at that bright yellow. There aren't a lot of bright yellow flowers for shady locations. And this is one that you might like to grow. Here it is. I'm trying to show you some combinations and these are all listed on your handout as well. So here it's with salvia, a cultivated plant and our native spider wart. So golden Alexander is a spring into early summer bloomer, so you'll get some nice blooming. Anytime you see the umbels like that, that's usually a good indication that it's a great pollinator plant for bees and other uh, pollinators. Columbine, our native columbine readily reseeds. I have a ton of them in the area I feed my birds and uh, they reseed readily. So I kind of just thin them out where I don't want them. And um, they're, it's wonderful. They bloom, the hummingbirds love them. I'll find butterflies nectaring on them. So it's a great way to help provide some extra food for those pollinators. Um, if you don't want them reseeding as those flowers fade before the seed pods develop, prune those off, do a little deadheading, remove those faded flowers. They're done helping to support our pollinators and you won't have as many seedlings. So full sun to shade, moist, well-drained soils. I find our native columbine, which is the orange and yellow, really tolerates fairly heavy shade. Golden ground cell is a native, Pacara. And a friend of mine sent a picture in his Facebook page, uh, post and it was huge. Ed Lyon, some of you may know, used to be at Allen Centennial Garden. And um, he's now in Ames, Iowa at uh, the Ryman Gardens associated with the university there. But he sent a picture of his planting and this really covered the area, very shade tolerant, tolerates sandy soils and it does attract a variety of native bees and butterflies. Mine are just starting to bloom right now in my shady part of the garden. Iris, bearded iris will also work. I'm a fan of Siberian iris because they tend to not get iris bore like the bearded or hybrid irises do. Um, the leaves look great all season, kind of grass-like, so kind of a nice substitute for ornamental grasses or addition to ornamental grasses. The seed pods I find are attractive, so I leave those up for winter, and the leaves turn a nice beigey orange in fall. So um, hummingbirds obviously love these. You'll find bees as well as butterflies nectaring on iris. Iris cristata is native. It's a um, shorter shade tolerant iris, often used as a ground cover. It has that typical iris leaf, but they only grow six to nine inches tall. Great for a shady ground cover. So it really covers that ground and the leaves hold up throughout the growing season. So typically blue, you may find some white ones, um, but just a wonderful shade tolerant ground cover. Again, an early season bloomer blooms before the Siberian iris. So it's there for our early visiting pollinators. Allium, um, we have some native onions or alliums, nodding um, onion, um, 
autumn onion, as well as cultivated alliums. And you can find spring, summer, and fall blooming alliums, and you'll find uh, bees and butterflies nectar got them. Animals tend to leave them be. They do reseed readily. I have to say, um, I'm often weeding these out. So this might be another one that when they're done blooming, if you've got enough seedlings and you don't want more, remove those faded flowers. But if you want some offspring, leave them, let them reseed and enjoy. Now, if you're a neat, tidy gardener, which you probably won't be if you're attracting pollinators, um, you're going to destroy some of those seedlings. So that's one way to manage, have it for the pollinators, but maybe contain the spread a bit. Here we've got allium with um, willow amsonia. That's the fine texture. That's the light blue flowers in the foreground that are kind of scattered. And then salvia as well. Willow, willow amsonia um, has wonderful spring blooms, nice foliage and good fall color. It's one of my favorites, a nice plant to mix with others. Here we are back at Lurie Gardens as well. Again, this was taken in late July. So salvia, excellent for hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. And here's some summer blooming alliums. This is, I think, ceruleum. The nice thing about Lurie Gardens, if you go to their website, they do talk about the different varieties of plants they grow. These were designed by Pete Udoff and Roy Diblick. Um, Pete Udoff is a designer out of Germany, and he is specialty along with Roy is looking at plants that grow well together in communities and that includes some natives and some cultivated as well. Our native penstemon digitalis um, beard's tongue. Uh, this one, unlike most penstemon, will tolerate some moist soil. So it's often used in rain gardens. It'll take it dry, it will take it moist. Full sun, a little bit of shade, you push it in too much shade, it'll tend to be floppy and not have as many flowers. It grows several feet tall. Hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees love this plant. It's a late spring, early summer to midsummer bloomer. And so you'll get some beautiful, the seed pods are pretty on them. A little deadheading will extend the bloom, but you can see some of those seed pods forming already. Coreopsis. Most Coreopsis like full sun, well drained to dry soils. And um, our native species is one of them is Lanceolata. I grow a lot of threadleaf Coreopsis, which is not native here, um, but I find the fine texture is nice. It doesn't reseed quite as readily, but boy, this is a nice addition to the landscape. A couple feet tall, full sun, well-drained soil. And one of the cool thing about Coreopsis is the butterflies and bees love the nectar, and then you'll find songbirds munching on the seeds. Garden Phlox, native to North America, fragrant flowers, wonderful plant, three feet tallish, um, long blooming, dead head, you know, as the flowers fade, remove those flowers, you'll get more bloom, more for the pollinators, and you also prevent some of the reseeding. Garden Phlox, especially the species, will reseed readily. Not that that's a problem unless you have more than you want. One of the downsides if you've grown garden flocks, as you know, it's very susceptible to powdery mildew. So again, depending on your view on native ours, there's a lot of cultivated varieties of garden flocks that are resistant to powdery mildew. So something to consider. One of my favorite um, native plants as I've studied more about native plants and incorporating more and I have more room to plant them is wild quinine. I read somewhere it attracts maybe like 20 different pollinators. Uh, you can see a hoverfly here, we'll find bees, we'll find butterflies. Um, it's a wonderful plant, full sun, well drained to dry soil, summer bloomer blooms for two to three months, no deadheading needed. What I like about this plant, I have it in a couple of garden beds, is it wanders, but it's not overly aggressive. It seems to kind of mingle as opposed to take over its neighbors. It grows to be several feet tall, a little more available now than it used to be. Clusters of white, um, small white flowers, individual flowers. And so they're held high on the plant. So nice looking leaves. It's about three feet tall, blooms for two to three months. Gorgeous addition to the landscape. Here you'll see um, wild quinine in the background. Um, we've got some rudbeckia in the front. The purple spiky flowers are anise hyssop. 
And we've got some Rudbeckia and cone flowers as well. Rattlesnake Master is another one of my favorite. It's called the botanical name. The second name is Yucca Folium. Yucca, the leaves look like a yucca plant. Look at those round flowers. Now, sometimes something so geometrical is really hard to blend into a landscape. And I find this one is a little bit easier to blend. And you can see here it's with some more fluffy plants. Again, this is another one that attracts a wide range of pollinators. And then the seeds are also good for the birds. It blooms for several months in the summer garden. For those shady spots, bugbane. The summer, it used to be Simus effuga, now it's Actea. So this blooms Actea racemosa, thinking racing to bloom in the summer, fragrant flowers in the evening, um, sometimes called fairy candle. It's held on six foot, the flowers are like six feet above the ground. The stems blend into the shade. And so they look like little fairies, be, fairies carrying candles through the garden. Wonderful. If you're in the southeast Wisconsin area, visit the rock garden at Berna Botanical Gardens in early to mid July. And it's just covered with bug bane and you feel like you're walking right amongst the plants. Great for pollinators. And there's a fall blooming one as well. Milkweed, we know it's great for monarch caterpillars. The flowers are fragrant in the evening, wonderful, but not only for monarchs. So it feeds the caterpillars, but the butterflies, monarchs, swallowtails, and a variety of other butterflies nectar on the flowers, and so do hummingbirds and bees. It is very aggressive. You can slow the spread by seed by removing the pods before they open, but it also spreads by underground stems called rhizomes that are six inches or more below ground and a half an inch to three quarters of an inch in diameter, and it's hard to contain them. So you may want to plant them in an area where you can keep them contained if you don't want them in every garden. There is one called Solvents, um, common milkweed that's a, a naturally occurring variety that's a little less aggressive. Swamp milkweed is also good. You'll use this a lot, see this a lot in rain gardens. It tolerates wet conditions, also called red milkweed, um, and dry conditions. It's more of a clumper, so it's less aggressive, grows four to five feet tall, also has fragrant flowers, and the caterpillars love it as well. I like butterfly weed for those hot, dry areas. It really stays put. It's a clumper. It doesn't reseed real readily. The caterpillars love this. That orange in the summer is gorgeous with purples. Um, I now have sandy soil, so it grows great. In the city, I had amended heavy soils. So they did okay, but not excellent. If you have clay soil, there's a naturally occurring variety called clay found by Prairie Nursery and available there as well. So if you struggled with it because your soils are heavy, try that one. Otherwise, this milkweed likes full sun, well-drained to dry soils, and it's much smaller in scale. And you can see there's a fly on there as well as butterflies and bees. Pale purple coneflower blooms earlier than purple coneflower. It's a little more adaptable to dry and wet soil than the purple coneflower. Notice the petals are narrow, otherwise very similar growth habit and has great pollinator appeal. Anise hyssop. This one is a pollinator magnet. This was in one of my garden beds and I was out taking some photos and I had lots of this anise hyssop agastache. And you can see all the silver spotted uh, skippers nectaring. There's a few bees if you look closely. And I also had swallowtail, cat uh, swallowtail butterflies on there. And I was in that garden bed and they didn't move at all. They were so visiting, busy nectaring. And I just wished I could have shared that experience. Full sun, well drained to dry soil, does reseed readily. And the leaves smell like anise, thus the name anise hyssop. And it's also popular with hummingbirds, just like Monarda. The name implies bees love it, bee bomb, Monarda. You can see a hawk moth here. You can see a fly. The bees love it. Hummingbirds love it. This is wild bergamot, our native Monarda. And this is another native Monarda didyma. And this is my friend Teases Garden, but look at how that Monarda spread. This is another one that's going to need space. So either put it in an area where you can keep it contained, or in the spring, a little aromatherapy as you thin out the unwanted plants. 
bee balm monarda is susceptible to powdery mildew. So one thing you can do is in the spring, thin out the planting, remove a fourth of the stems, better light penetration, better airflow. Make sure they have plenty of space to grow and they're growing in full sun. That reduces the risk. What I do is plant things a little shorter to cover that powdery mildew infected leaves and I can still see the blooms and I don't have to do much hard work. Black-eyed Susan's a prairie favorite. Full sun, well-drained soil. Our native Rebecca's are resistant to the uh, leaf spot disease that has really wreaked havoc on things like Goldstream Rebecca. These do recede readily, so you'll attract the pollinators, hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. Leave the seeds for the birds for the winter, and you will probably be thinning a few out. Rudbeckia triloba is a taller one with a finer textured leaves. Um, and then look at how look at how your eye follows the yellow. Yellow flowers really grab your attention, and so this is just a nice natural planting. Purple coneflower, the most popular native plant in North America, um, supports hummingbirds, butterflies, bees. The seeds feed our songbirds. Um, it's a very popular plant. It does reseed readily. When I lived in the city, I was so excited that I had my first yard. I planted three of these in the backyard. And at the end of three years, that's all I had. So I ended up sharing them with our county parks before jumping worms were a problem. And, uh, and then I had to kind of keep them under control just because I wanted to grow other things than just purple cone flower. But a wonderful plant, full sun, um, will tolerate moist soils, it actually likes moist, well-drained soils is what it prefers, drought tolerant once established. This is red gilia or scarlet gilia. Um, it's a biennial. So the first year you get this fuzzy growth of leaves. It's only about six inches tall, very cool. The second year it sends up these flower spikes that hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees like. So it's a biennial. Boy, it's an attention getter. This was on a garden tour. I used to have this in my house in Milwaukee and I need to get some back in this garden. Um, just very vertical, much easier to grow than cardinal flower. Liatra, several different native varieties, excellent for butterflies. Hummingbirds will nectar on these. And if you leave the seeds develop, the birds will come and feed on the seeds in these fluffy seed heads. Uh, it does reseed. So I put it with the purple coneflower, Liatris, and Rudbeckia. You know, in the native prairies, they kind of duke it out. They find their own space. In your yard, you may end up with one and not the other. So you may need to do a little thinning. This was another one I shared with the county parks. Here's Liatris on the left, red hot poker, not native, but the hummingbirds like it. It likes well-drained, dry soils. And the orange in the back is Tithonia or Mexican sunflower. If you've tried cardinal flower and failed, don't worry, you're not alone. It's a little short-lived perennial and finding just the right spot. Full sun, depart shade, moist, well-drained soils, but you can grow it in a water garden, you can grow it along a shoreline, and you can grow it in a garden. But finding just the right conditions sometimes can be challenging. It is a hummingbird favorite, and that spike of red flowers in the summer can't be beat. This is a planting at the Wisconsin State Fair. They used it along a water feature, so perfect place. We have some in our rain garden at We Energy Energy Park at State Fair. And uh, uh, I was there today. I think it made it through the second winter. It's always a challenge. So uh, you'll have to stop by in August and visit. I find giant or great blue lobelia much easier to bloom. Blooms later, late summer into fall. It does spread, but it's not overly aggressive. Hummingbirds like this as well. This is a perennial. Um, and so this will attract other pollinators. And I find it a lot easier than cardinal flower and tends to be longer lived. Here you can see it with hosta as well as some rudbeckia. End the season with some goldenrod, excellent pollinator plant because it's charging them up for whether they're migrating or getting ready to hibernate. Now, showy goldenrod is less aggressive. Um, I was visiting our We Energy Garden. We have a goldenrod that we need to weed out because it's taking over. So when you're looking for goldenrod, Prairie Nursery has great descriptions and talks about those like showy 
and stiff goldenrod that are less aggressive and a little more suitable for the garden. Here it's teamed up with asters. What a beautiful combination, that purple New England aster with the stiff goldenrod. And asters are another way to end the season and provide that nectar that those pollinators need. Here it's with tiger eye sumac. And I've heard mixed results that it's as aggressive as our native sumac and some that say it's less so. I love the purple and gold combination as gorgeous. Just know that sumac can be a little assertive. This is at the National Arboretum and you can see the New England aster it looks really nice and blue. The fine foliage is Willow Amsonia starting to turn its amber fall color. And then there's some little blue stem as well. But asters uh, can be floppy, so give them some, sh some good stiff neighbors to hold them upright, cutting them back early in the season, keeping them six inches tall through June, early July, if you're in the south, will then keep them more compact with more flowers. But I'm a low input gardener, so I just like good stiff neighbors. Calico aster or woodland aster is shade tolerant, so if you've got more shade than sun, this would be an aster to choose from. Don't overlook our ornamental grasses. The seeds of little blue stem are good for the songbirds. It's a host for many, a couple different skipper caterpillars. Prairie drop seed blooms late in the season. The seeds persist, adding winter interest, nice fall color. I think this works great in natural gardens, informal gardens, and even formal gardens in place of fountain grass. This is native. And so it's a wonderful addition to the garden and it's a host plant for several different caterpillars. Here it's combined with artichoke and jolt um, dianthus, an annual that's excellent for pollinators that's very heat tolerant. I took this picture in August in Chicago at Ball Horticulture in our native switchgrass. Um, I think this is north, this was taken at Northwind uh, Perennial Farm. It's Northwind switchgrass, a nice narrow upright switchgrass. So you get lots of height with a narrow footprint. Finches love the seeds. It's a host plant for several different caterpillars. I'm gonna wrap it up with a few, quickly wrap it up with a few annuals. I know I'm going long. Let me talk about plants, I can't stop. Start or end the season with these cool tolerant pansies and stocks. Stocks, what a terrible name, are fragrant. Pollinators love them. So get those in the garden early in a container like you see here to make sure the bees and early visiting butterflies have a source of nectar and end the season for colorful for you to enjoy as well as the pollinators. Begonias, excellent for hummingbirds. This is dragon wing begonia and it takes sun to shade. It grows 20 inches tall, no deadheading needed. It's a nice pollinator plant. Impatience, I had somebody tell me they saw hummingbirds nectaring on the impatience flowers, sitting on the ground nectaring on those flowers, maybe better in a hanging basket for that uh, safety, but you'll find bees and butterflies. Now downy mildew was a problem on many impatience. There are mildew resistant impatience, sun impatience, beacon and bounce and New Guinea are all resistant to downy mildew. So if you have shady spots, want to attract pollinators, but have had problems with dip downy mildew on your handout, I mentioned those resistant varieties. Sweet alyssum, wonderful fragrance. They tolerate cooler temperatures, sometimes recede. So you get really a good source of nectar throughout the season, but especially early and late when there's such a shortage of flowers. I had a gentleman that said he planted these on his, in pots on his deck and he never saw them, but he had a huge prairie out beyond his deck. And I said, well, the pollinators are out there. They don't need your sweet alyssum. This is a good choice for those of us in the city or urban areas. Ageratum, I like to grow Blue Horizon, which is 20 inches tall. It's a little more informal, but butterflies and bees love them and hummingbirds will nectar on this as well. I always keep a pot of these near my living room window to watch the hummingbirds and butterflies visit. For those hot, dry areas, lantana is a good choice. Just pluck off any of the berries that start to form, minimal deadheading needed. These are shrubs in the southern part of the U.S. and invasive in Texas. So be careful if you're from those uh, areas. If you're a Midwest or Northern gardener, they're annuals for us. Great for butterflies, great for bees, tolerates hot, dry conditions. So perfect for containers.
Pentas, um, a butterfly magnet. When I started working for Birds and Blue magazine, back in the olden days, the mid 90s, they give me photos to ID the plant. And um, I was looking at like 16 different photos and they were all pentas and butterflies. And I thought I mis ID'd them. So I asked some of my plant friends to help me to confirm I was right. And sure enough, they were all pentas. Go to find out, come to find out that they use pentas in butterfly houses because they're so nectar rich and the butterflies love them. A lot more available than they used to be. And one plant, they grow about oh, 15 to 18 inches tall and one plant fills up a good square foot. So I would use them because they're a little pricier in a container or just even five or six would put on a good display. Cigar plant, hummingbird magnet. Um, I always talk about this. I always plant these um, in a pot or container. This is Dawn who works with me. She used an old teapot. I was telling the story about these being great hummingbird plants. And one of my students called me. He had worked all day out in the field. And he said, I'm sitting on my deck enjoying a beverage. And I have a pot of those cigar plants, kufia, that you recommended. And here's a hummingbird nectaring at my elbow. So it's a great hummingbird plant and fun. Uh, they, I think they often call them firecracker plants too. I think it's more politically correct though. Firecracker cigars, I'm not sure. I mentioned Nicotiana. They're flowering plants that hold their flowers 24 hours a day and they're fragrant in the evening. So always check the tag. Some of the breeding has bred out the fragrance, but a lot of them are breeding back in the fragrance. So great for day pollinators as well as nighttime, hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies, and moths. Cosmos, you can start them from seed. So save some money in your plant budget. They will reseed. Again, if you're not neat and tidy, pollinators, butterflies, and bees love the flowers, and finches love the seed. So it's a good addition. One of my favorite hummingbird plants is black and blue salvia. Um, I was in Maryland speaking this winter and found out these are hardy for them, not for me. So I grow them as an annual. They're three feet tall. The, the sepal, um, the calyx, that black part on the end, and then the blue flower, thus the name black and blue. Hummingbirds love this plant. We were shooting a Melinda's garden moment at um, Lark's home and she had hummingbird feeders and pots of these all along her living room window. And John, the videographer was standing between several pots of this plant shooting into the garden. I was in a different garden bed and the hummingbird was nectaring, nectaring, and then right in his forehead. And then another salvia nectar, nectar back at John. And he's like, I'm moving. I'm getting out of the way of this hummingbird. So they weren't put out by him. They just wanted him to leave. So they had free range of all these plants. Great big bull, no deadheading needed, blooms all summer and the hummingbirds love it. And here it is in the garden, just to give you a sense of size. Um, other salvias, um, scarlet, orange, red, or white, you can find them in a variety of colors. This is lady in red. And the goldfinches love the seeds. So what was cool is I was at our botanic garden one year. They grew this in front of their administration building. So there were still some flowers and some had already set seed and the goldfinches were eating the seeds. And so the yellow goldfinches with the red bloom, just gorgeous. Zinnia is another one you could start from seed and get flowers in eight weeks. So you could extend your plant budget. Um, and Single varieties, as I mentioned, like the Profusion, which has great disease resistance, excellent state fair, a variety of zinnias available in different heights and great pollinator plants for butterflies as well as bee. Um, Mexican sunflower, this is a big plant, five or six feet tall. Fiesta del Sol is more like three feet tall. Bright orange flowers, hard to find transplants. I have found them in a few garden centers. I start mine from seeds indoors. Um, actually, I'm having pretty good luck. I started a little late, so I'm going to have some beautiful orange flowers. I have a bed with my butterfly weed, some purple flowers, and so this goes nicely, and it's a great pollinator plant, and it blooms uh, midsummer into fall. 
and of course sunflowers. We're doing a sunflower project as part of the pollinator month celebration. Hummingbirds, butterflies, bees you'll find. And how can you not like sunflowers, right? And then if you leave them stand, the birds and squirrels eat the seeds or maybe you harvest a few to enjoy full sun, well-drained to dry soil. Cardinal climber is a relative of morning glory. It does not reseed readily like morning glory does. It's not quite as big. Um, if you can find transplants, you'll get earlier bloom. This is right outside my living, my living room uh, on my patio. And I love watching the hummingbirds come to nectar. So I use it as a vertical accent in containers. And don't forget your herbs. Um, swallowtail caterpillars love dill and parsley. This is one of my beds and I grew the dill. I don't use it a lot for cooking. I grew it for the swallowtail caterpillars. I grew bronze fennel in the same bed and I found they weren't munching on it. So I'm ripping that out because it reseeds like dill and I'm replacing it with some dill and some green fennel. Parsley is another favorite as well for the swallowtail caterpillar. Lavender, bees, butterflies, great. You get the fragrance, full sun, well-drained soil, tough for those of us in clay. And if you're in a colder climate, hid coat, H-I-D-C-O-T-E, or Munstead are the hardier varieties. And phenomenal is huge and phenomenal. And I've had reports from gardeners that have had great success in zone five with it overwintering. So I know I covered a lot and I covered it fast and I left a lot of good pollinator plants out, but hopefully this inspired you or gave you some ideas how to create your own pollinator habitats. And I always end every talk by asking you to help me grow gardeners. This is my granddaughter, Maya, when she was much younger, she'll be 15 soon and she is a gardener, um, but help grow and inspire someone else, whether it's the youngsters in your life, a retiree, a new a family down the block growing their first garden, or maybe you're a new gardener and welcome. We're so happy to have you in our family of gardeners. Please share your passion and inspire others to grow beautiful gardens. My goal is to grow a kinder and gentler world, one garden, a garden at a time. And you know what? I'm going to need your help doing it. So please join us to celebrate Pollinator Month. Invite others to do the same. Um, as I mentioned, there's lots going on. We have videos, how-to videos, activity sheets, story time, and more. Please join me. Call, Kelly mentioned the upcoming webinars. Um, we hope you can join us for those as well. And then thanks again to American Transmission Company and their Grow Smart program for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, thanks to the Public Library for hosting the Wisconsin and Upper Michigan Public Libraries of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan for joining in the celebration and really helping being good stewards for the environment as well. Please stay connected. All my contact information is on the handout. I know I went over my hour, sorry, um, but I appreciate your staying in touch. I really try hard, but you know, Kelly knows me. I uh, give me a little time and I'll take it. But I'm happy to answer questions if ooh, it looks like we have um, a few. So, yeah, we have quite a few questions. Um, so, thanks so much, Melinda, for that presentation. Um, yeah, that it's just bursting with so much um, knowledge. And I know we will reshare the handout um, within a few days along with the link to the recording. So, you'll have the handout, you'll be able to review that along with the recording and you know, just review that um, at your leisure. So, okay, so let's dive into some of these questions. <clears throat> um, we had a couple questions about honeysuckle. Um, let's see, one person wants to know, uh, how does the honeysuckle do if I kept it in a large pot to minimize spreading? Um, I'm limited in the area that I can plant vines that spread. So honeysuckle vine is not aggressive like trumpet vine. So even in the ground, it's going to grow up it's not gonna send out suckers. So you won't have to worry. It's not like the honeysuckle shrubs, the bad ones, the Lanicera that we're worried that the birds eat the seeds and poop them all over and spread it. So I've grown a honeysuckle vine, the native one in my city lot. And it just, it forms a footprint about all oh, two feet in diameter at the most. And so you could just train up a trellis or an obelisk. I have it on an obelisk outside my bedroom uh, between the kitchen and bedroom 
bedroom so I can watch it from either place. So honeysuckle vine is a good choice for a small space. So that's a good one. The trumpet vine is the one that hummingbirds love, but it sends runners all over. So that's the one you don't want to do, but do the native coral honeysuckle vine. Um, and Major Wheeler, I still get lots of pollinators on there and it doesn't get the powdery mildew. So it's a cultivar if you don't mind using a native var, that might be one to consider because of the mildew resistance. Uh, see, Megan would like to know, are there types of honeysuckle that are not invasive? I live in Kansas City, my sister's from Verona and our friend has invasive honeysuckle that is hard to get rid of. Yes, I would say most of the, um, there are some that are supposed to spread less. So what I would suggest you do is, I know, and I have honeysuckle and buckthorn, I'm trying to get rid of on my property. So I feel your pain. So if you're trying to eliminate that, using the native Dervilla, which they call bush honeysuckle, is a summer bloomer. And that would be a better choice. The vine honeysuckle, the coral honeysuckle, um, Linus resemper virens, is not invasive. There is the Japanese honeysuckle vine that is invasive, so you want to avoid that one. Um, so I would recommend, and I know honeysuckle, the wonderful fragrant flowers in the spring, but boy, they are just taking over and crowding everything out. So as you tackle the bad honeysuckle, consider some of those other shrubs maybe in the place. So a chokeberry would be a wonderful replacement. The button bush, if it's a moist area, would be a good replacement. The native dervilla, which is called bush honeysuckle, would be a good re uh, replacement. And those are really great pollinator plants as well. Here's a great question. Um, so it's thinking about no mow May and okay. kind of some of us got comfortable that mowing. <laughs> um, we want to convert our yards completely to pollinator plants uh, so we don't need to mow anymore. Uh, would simply rototilling the grass and then scattering seeds be good enough to get the flowers to sprout or should we really be tarping all the ground to kill off the grass before scattering the seeds? You know, that's a really good question. So a couple places I'm going to send you. Prairie Nursery talks a lot about establishing native plantings. And, and one of the problems is if you're if you don't have any weeds, that's great. But I'm guessing if you did no mo may, you probably have some weeds, which are fine for the pollinators. But when you're trying to get native plants established, those weeds can outcompete them. So a couple options you can do if you cultivate, you really need to do that twice a month for at least one, if not two years to make sure you manage quack grass, any of the other grass and weeds. You can solarize, so cut the grass short, cover it with clear plastic, cook it. Uh, Minnesota says a couple weeks, Kansas State University usually says six weeks in the hottest part of the season. Um, there was a guy on, I was on um, Garden Talk recently on public radio here in Wisconsin, and a guy who, a gentleman who does, um, starts to, he does a lot of ecological restorations. He uses, he cuts grass short, throw down cardboard, you could probably do newspaper, covers it with some soil, and then plants the seed. So the cardboard and newspaper smother the grass, a little bit of compost or soil on top, allow the seeds to germinate, and then they'll root through that cardboard. So he finds that works well. I have an area I want to convert to prairie, but I have so many weeds that I really need to get the weeds under control before I plant. So I'm going to try an area using his technique where I put down some cardboard, put down some soil, and then plant, put the seeds down there, lightly rake and get them started. Um, otherwise, you really do need to kill off, you could use a sod cutter and remove the sod depending on how much room you could rent those. That's what I've done to start a few beds, rented a sod cutter. Maybe you have someone that needs that sod. You could give it to them if they want to mow. And then if you need to add any organic matter to the soil and then seed, that would be one way if you don't want to use chemicals to kill the grass that you could remove that and the weeds and then start. And that would be a way to do it and speed up the process. Good question. So if anyone else out there would like to try out this idea, um, do we need to be worried about any like water runoff, the yard is on an incline, anything like that? 
Okay, so if you're going to kill off the grass and plant is what I'm guessing. So that's really, really good. One of the Kelly and I work together with Fresh Coast Guardians doing webinars too. And so we're always talking about keeping water where it falls. So if you don't mind using a chemical, I know I just told you don't do it. But if you decide to use a total vegetation killer, what I usually tell people to do on a slope is leave the dead grass intact. And then you might want to plant some transplants or use a slit seeder or create slits to plant the seeds in. So the dead grass acts as a mulch while those seeds are getting started. It holds the soil in place. That's a great question. Um, you know, putting down some mulch. Also, you know, hydro seeding is something that's done on roadways because it's a kind of, and you could even buy cellulose type of mulch, which kind of forms that crusty covering. So that helps hold the soil in place while those seeds germinate. So good question about worrying about runoff. So you may want to either, you know, start up on the top, leaving some grass on the bottom. So while you have bare soil for those seeds to get established, any runoff is going to hit the grass, slow it down before it goes into the storm sewer. And then as the, the plants towards the top of that hill are established, they're going to help slow down. So you might want to do it in phases. Or again, if you don't mind using a total vegetation killer once, to do that, knock it down, and then slit seed in. And that may just be cutting through yourself as opposed to renting a slit seeder and then planting the seed. And so that's one way to keep it intact. Or you might want to do a combination of transplants and seeds so you have something and mulch definitely. So great question. Got a question from Amanda here. I've had a difficult time getting bee balm and milkweed to grow from seed um, direct. So I also had some milkweed transplants to develop yellow leaves and fall off. I'm hoping to get these established in my yard. So if you have any advice, that would be appreciated. You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of smiling because I hear that complaint about starting common milkweed from seed in the garden. And if it seeds itself, there's no stopping it, right? So it's pretty funny. If you've ever dug up a rhizome, if you've got anyone that's weeding it out and they pull out a rhizome, the underground stem, you'll see lots of little plantlets. I would try to get those and put them in the garden. I've had good luck with both of those doing winter sowing. And there is a winter sowing video I did for American Transmission Company on their Grow Smart website page. I don't think it's in the pollinator page. And it's basically, I learned this from master gardeners when I was traveling and speaking, taking a milk jug, cutting it. So you just leave it attached by the handle, put about three or four inches of potting mix in the bottom, you've punched holes in, plant your seeds, put it out December, January. Um, the soil's moist, um, it gets the cold treatment it needs, and it's see, I've done butterfly weed, I've done common milkweed, and I've done a bee balm also. The other um, thing is if you do have someone that's got it in their yard, helping them thin out their planting in the spring and dig some of those. Most people have more than they want and would be happy to give you a trowel full to plant in your garden. And that might be good. Um, when you get your seeds, make sure they don't that they've been treated, that they received that cold treatment they needed. And if they haven't, you'll need to refrigerate them. Or if you're collecting the seeds, um, you need to remove the fluff off the milkweed, uh, store it in the refrigerator, not the freezer, for the couple of months in the winter, same with the bee bomb, and that should give you some better success. The other thing is I use a lot of row cover when I plant seeds, I have lots of birds, which I'm happy, but they like to eat my seeds. So when I'm planting seeds, I'll often use this row cover, fabric that lets air, light, and water through, traps the heat so it speeds germination, but it protects them from the birds until they're up and growing, and then I can remove that. Or you can leave it on as long as you want until they're flowering, but that's going to be big plants. But get them a good start so the bee, uh, birds don't eat your seeds. That will speed germination. That may help as well. So I know a lot of the plants we talked about this evening are like full sun, part shade. Um, are there any pollinator friendly plants that do well in the shade? Yes, and thank you for asking. So our native are spring ephemerals. Think about those like the spring beauty, trout lily, uh, bloodroot, um, let's see, 
trilliums, those are all spring ephemeral. So they come up, they bloom, their leaves die back. So that's good for those early pollinators. So look for a woodland wildflowers. Woodland phlox, the one I showed you is great for shade. And I, my apologies for not making that clear. It grows about 15 inches tall. Golden Alexander, that yellow flower will tolerate shade as well. Pretty good shade tolerance. And that's a late spring, summer bloomer. I've pushed native Columbine. I had it on the north side of my city lot. And I had big Norway maples in the county easement next to me. So it was pretty heavy shade and it bloomed for me. Excellent pot, you know, for the hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, coral bells is not native, but it's shade tolerant. And look for those that are known for their flowers because hummingbirds and butterflies nectar on those. The bug bane, I mentioned that really tall one, which is really nice because getting a shade plant that's tall. The golden ground cell is a great pollinator plant, has a long bloom period in uh, late spring, early summer with those bright yellow flowers. So it's another good shade tolerant um, pollinator friendly plant. The bug bane also has a fall bloomer as well. Uh, uh, it's called Ramosa, Actea Ramosa or Simplex. So that'll get you some flowers in the spring. The crested iris, the iris cristata that I showed you, that low growing six to nine inches, very shade tolerant. Um, usually I take the part shade approach and I know you're gonna push it into shade, but I've seen that one grow in some pretty heavy shade. The leaves last all season, so it's good erosion control or good ground cover and great pollinator plant. So hopefully I went through those fast, sorry. Um, I need to add that to my list of topics, maybe pollinators for shade plants, uh, shade areas. And then the coral honeysuckle will tolerate shade as well. So Laura would like to know, um, is there a good way that you can tell you're buying a native plant by the way it's named? Any clues with scientific names, anything like that? Yeah, so as opposed to maybe a native are so, um, so a native plant would have the genus and the, so like switchgrasses, Panicum virgatum, but north wind switchgrass would be Panicum virgatum in single quotes, north wind. Now, what I've noticed, because there's been such a movement for native plants and shame on the nurseries kind of not being totally upfront is often they'll say this native plant, but it's a cultivar of a native plant. And so, yes, looking at the botanical name, um, and then sometimes it even has the weird uh, patent name, which is numbers and letters. So, yes, it should be a genus. That's the first name in capital letters. So that was Panicum. The second name, lowercase, Brigadum. And then cultivars are capitalized non-italics in single quotes. And so usually reading the description, you can kind of get a clue, but that's a great question. And I, I don't know that it's necessarily they're trying to be deceitful, but I think they're, you know, riding the wave of native plants. And I grow native var, so I'm not anti-native var. I grow native, I have more room now to grow a lot more native plants, but in the city, I didn't have space. And so that was a choice I made. So I appreciate that's a great question. So you know, you're getting what you ask for. So good, good question. So uh, related to that, um, do you have any suggestions for good locations to find native seed packets or plants for planting? Um, so I know, I know we talked about in earlier workshops, uh, the MMSD plant sale, but I think that might be closed at this yes. point. Yeah, so a couple things. Um, if you're in the Milwaukee metro area, I don't think they're having a fall sale this year, but they, the Milwaukee Metro Sewage District wants people to grow rain gardens, good for pollinators, good for keeping water on the property. So watch for that. Um, Prairie Nursery and Prairie, Prairie Nursery is a Wisconsin-based native nursery, been in business way before natives were popular. They have seeds as well as plants, um, but they're pretty much sold out. They usually have plants available again late summer. Um, but I was looking for some plants to fill in some places where things didn't make it. Um, Prairie Moon is out of Minnesota. I've heard good things about them. 
Um, so a lot of them, and then nature centers, a lot of nature centers and wild ones, the organization wild ones. I know last two weekends ago, maybe they were doing a couple of different wild ones throughout Wisconsin. We're having plant sales. And so I would check with your na local nature. Uh, nature Center, your extension service, if you're not in the Wisconsin area. Um, but a lot of those are having sales, and that's a great place to find native plants, too. So, of course, online, the closer you can buy them to where you garden, the better. You want them to be regionally sourced. So, you know, even though it's all Panicum Brigadum, the ones collected in the north are a little different than the south. So if you really want regional specificity, that's a good thing too. So check Nature Center's extension and um, look for reviews of online sources. Again, in Wisconsin, Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon in Minnesota um, are a couple of places um, I bought from and heard good things from others too. I just want to give a little shout out to um, the Tippy Canoe Branch Library uh, in Milwaukee. If anyone's in oh. the area, take a look at our butterfly garden. Um, we got those from the Heritage Flower Farm in, um, I think, Moguanago. Um, um, and, and Betty Edelman was one of my students. So oh, I'm very, nice. and I bought a few things from, so good point. Thank you. And Tippy Canoe <laughs> Library is a cool library, so. Yeah. Thank you. So that's that's a good point. And more garden centers are carrying native plants, too. And mm -hmm. thank you for mentioning Heritage Flower Farm, Northwind Perennial in Burlington. Um, you know, I think you'll find more and more um, carrying a variety of those. So thanks for good. Good mention. Thank you, Kelly. Great. I'm just looking at our remaining questions here. Um, OK, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Martha would like to know, what is the very best low growing to medium height plant or shrub that will attract monarchs? So, um, so butterfly weed is perfect for now, if you want the butterflies and the caterpillars, if you want to provide food, the milkweeds are the plants for the caterpillars. So butterfly weed is about 18 to 20 inches tall and about 24 inches wide. It likes well-drained, full sun conditions. Um, swamp milkweed is taller. So that's, you know, that's going to be four feet tall and so is common milkweed. So if you've got good sun and well-drained soil, that's a good choice for the monarch caterpillars and the monarch butterflies and the hummingbirds as well. You'll find monarch caterpillars nectaring on a variety of plants. Um, so a lot of your low growing plants will work for your monarch butterflies, just won't be a place for them to lay their eggs and uh, for the caterpillars. Um, in terms of other perennials that are low growing, your Coreopsis um, lanceolata, that would be a good one. That native plant's about 20 inches tall. Um, shrub wise, I'm not, you know, a lot of those, that's an early bloomer. The Aronia is done blooming by the time the monarchs usually make it up here. Um, so I think I'd stick to some low growing perennials for the, the nectar source. But again, butterfly weed would be a good one if you want the caterpillars. So Elena would like to know, are there any good pollinator friendly plants that rabbits won't eat? <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. I just, because I usually try to avoid this subject as well as deer. Um, most of our native plants, most of them tend to be pretty resistant to deer and rabbits. Um, on your handout, I tried to call out those that were um, resistant, um, tend to be resistant. The University of North Carolina has an excellent plant gardener's toolbox, um, which has great plant information and they talk about resistance. So does Morton Arboretum on their website. And so, um, so let, I, I have a lot of rabbits and deer on my property and I grow a lot of flowers. So they tend to leave, um, let's see, I'm going through my list. They tend to leave coral bells alone, which is good for hummingbirds and some butterflies. Uh, the Coreopsis, usually they leave alone. I bet somebody out there is gonna say, but they ate mine. Um, they love flocks, so I would not 
plant flocks, if rabbits are a big pressure, cone flowers tend to be resistant. Um, the milkweeds tend to be resistant. Um, liatris tends to be resistant. The gay feather tends to be resistant. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going through the, the seasonal interest. Uh, golden Alexander, they typically leave alone. The pack, the golden round cell, they tend to leave alone. Um, iris usually have fairly good success. They may nibble on the leaves. So those, a lot of what I covered tonight, a lot of the native plants tend to be resistant, but again, those flocks are like candy to them. So I would uh, avoid those. But the cone flower, the Rudbeckia, usually you you know, if they do some munching, usually you have enough to compensate and the liatris as well. And the milkweed, of course. Good question. One I don't like to answer, but a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a comment um, from Julie on that. Um, I found deer don't eat Jacob's ladder. Oh, so. that's good. And that's a nice spring. Blo mine's blooming right now. So thank you. See, this is what I love about gardeners. They like to share. And I don't think the rabbits have been eating. I've got bunnies all over my yard this year. So yeah, I'll have to go check that out. Uh, let's see, I've got a question from Terry here. Um, is it best to let dill go to seed when growing it to attract swallowtail butterflies? Well, the benefit of that is it will reseed. So the swallowtail caterpillars are feeding, uh, you know, they you have to let them bloom because that's that attracts the adults but the caterpillars are laid on the leaves. So by letting them reseed, you'll have dill forever and ever and ever. So with pollinators, they're attracted to the pollen. Host plants are plants that the adults lay their eggs on. And so parsley, dill, fennel are all things that the swallowtail caterpillars. Dawn, who works with me, um, picked up some tomato cages. We were plant shopping together and she's gonna wrap them um, to keep the birds from eating the swallowtail caterpillar. She doesn't care about the swallowtail caterpillars eating, and she's a great cook, eating her fennel and dill. So, you know, we are kind of crazy, aren't we, as the gardeners and pollinator fans? So um, the flowers will attract the butterflies, but the, the leaves are what they lay their eggs on. And then the seeds are, you know, if you don't want a bunch of seedlings, yes, you could remove the flowers as they fade but you may want to leave some so that you'll get more like cilantro is another one that reseeds readily. More questions here. Uh, Carol says, I used preen, P-R-E-E-N, in a flower bed this spring, and I've noticed my yarrow and cone flowers are struggling. Could the preen have been the cause of this? Um, it might be weather conditions. We've had that extreme heat, dry, wet, cold, crazy weather. Preen is a pre-emergent that prevents seeds from germinating. Always check the label because there are some plants that it can be phytotoxic to any product can be. And that's why label reading the label is so important because even things that are labeled for use on plants can be causing that. You won't get the reseeding of those plants. So when you use preen, it not only kills weed seeds, but it can prevent good seeds from sprouting too. So that's kind of a downside if you're depending on plants reseeding. It is a possibility, I would check the label, even though it's too late to do anything, but before you put any more down or in the future, check to make sure, um, look at the material safety data sheet. So when I'm looking up information on a chemical, I go to the internet and I would put like preen MSDS material safety data sheet. And then that has even more detail than the label. Um, so start with the label and then that, and there's usually an 800 number associated and they should have the information too, if it's any counter, if it's counteracting. Um, coneflowers do have problems with aster yellows. Yarrow might too, but you probably would have known noticed deformed flowers, uh, maybe green petals instead of the colorful ones. If you had aster yellows, it survives the crown of the plant. It usually doesn't kill it, but then you have the source of disease to spread to others. So I, I don't usually see aster yellows on yarrow. I don't think it's susceptible, but it's possible. But you would see poor growth, stunted growth and discolored yellowish leaves. Um, but you know, it could be the weather related, could be winter, open winter. I'm seeing some plants late to emerge and struggling this year. And it's 
think about our weather. Um, if you were in Wisconsin, anyway, Southern Wisconsin was open. We had some cold weather, very little snow cover. So um, it, it could be some other things, but I checked the label again, just to make sure. I think uh, one more question from Nancy here. Um, does salvia grow in root runners? Salvia is a clumper, typically spreads, um, so it doesn't form the rhizomes. I think that's what you mean, like to take over. And so um, the salvia gar gargantica, which is that black and blue salvia, actually forms tubers. I've overwintered it inside, and, and when I've dug it up, it has little tubers um as well as roots so no it's not a rhizomaceous meaning it's like doesn't spread like milkweed it does get bigger in clumps but it's more of a clumper all right and then i know i've got a few questions from folks um wondering about the recording so yeah this is being recorded um and then typically within a few days of the program we'll send out a link to the recording um, along with melinda's handout so you'll have that um that reference material i know some of you are probably trying to write down notes as sorry fast as you can. <laughs> But that's great. It's a great problem to have. So you'll be able to have um, the source material and then um, you can review that uh, this summer um, at your leisure. So. And the um, handout, if you've never attended a webinar with me, they're long because there's no page limit. And I put lots of links in there and a lot of detail because I just want to inspire you tonight. And then hopefully that helps you as a reference too. So thanks for mentioning that, Kelly. All right, so let me just take a second, final look here. We have a lot of thanks, Melinda, so much for, for this program this evening. Thank um, all of you for joining us. Yeah, so thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you also for all of your questions. It's really yes. interesting. Um, so uh, like we mentioned, there are two more webinars this month in this series that you can register for um, if you're, you know, not able to make it. If you're registered, you'll still get that email um, sent out with the recording and the handout as well. So you'll be able to review that um, if that's the case. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we just want to encourage you uh, to check out the other um, programs that Milwaukee Public Library is hosting this month. We have a lot of story times. Um, we also have, um, you know, these webinars for adults. We have several book lists for all ages as yeah. well. So you can read more about pollinators um, and explore um, more of those resources at the library. Um, and we just also want to thank Melinda, of course, as usual, for a wonderful evening and a wonderful program. And we're just, we're so delighted to be able to, to host these with you. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Libraries are near and dear to my heart, as well as all you gardeners out there. So thanks for making our evening special. All right. So yeah, everyone, um, keep an eye out for that follow-up email and we'll send that out soon here. Thanks so much again for tuning in and thanks Melinda also for uh, staying a little late here to answer everyone's questions. I know they appreciate it. Always happy to do that. Thanks. All right. Well, have a great evening, everyone, and we will see you next time. So take care. Take Goodbye. Right, bye now.